Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Lovely to be here with you all. And uh, our church, very similar to this, is just like being at home. And I uh, just love salt of the earth people. Amen. That's what God's looking for. God's not looking for anyone extra special. God's looking for those who uh, want to repent and call out to him and be saved. And uh, all the people said to that, amen. That's exactly right. And we've come up from Goulburn, and it was a, it was a long drive, but we made it to church on time, which was good. <laughs> so, but I'm here with my wife, Deborah, and uh, she's uh, been a stalwart for me right through our 20 or 25 years of ministry that we've had. Uh, without her, I wouldn't have made it. I can tell you that right now. And, and our family, or our, uh, we, we operate from Ephesians where husbands and wives submit yourselves, therefore, one to another in the Lord. That's how we work. And uh, it's always been a blessing to know that uh, she's right beside me. She's strong and uh, she's uh, always very discerning. It's good to have a discerning friend, especially a wife. And uh, as I said, she's been such a blessing. And for the first time in many years, I've got my whole family here. Uh, I'm uh, coming to hear us uh, preach. And so it's been a, a wonderful blessing to come. And I'll just share a little bit because a bit about me and the message anyway. But just a little bit, when my call to the ministry, um, I got saved. It was, um, what was it now, about 40, 30-something years ago now. And uh, it was not long after I was saved. Uh, I was a linesman at the time and I was working on the power lines and they turned the power back on. And I was stuck up there and I was up there for about four or five minutes. My heart stopped no breathing and, and uh, I was yeah, very sick for quite a long time and in fact I didn't remember, I only remembered my wife, I didn't remember anything else, I couldn't drive, couldn't operate anything, I just woke up one day a few weeks later on the couch at home, my wife saying, Dennis you're at home and you, you've had an accident and, uh, and that was, I had to learn to drive again and, and reading was hard and because uh, I was one of these people that... Um, if I read something or started, studied something, I was the one everyone else at school hated. I just remembered it. <laughs> I didn't have to study. I didn't have to struggle with learning things. I would just go through the whole school year doing basically nothing. And then a month before the exams, I would read, read my schoolwork and I'd remember everything and pass with flying colours. And, uh, but I, I've learnt since through the accident that I know without a doubt God allowed that to happen because God can't use that. He can't use people who want to do it themselves or who can do it themselves. And he, he took away from me the one thing that I could have relied on instead of him. And now I've got to study properly. I've got to read. And people say to me, this verse here, and I'm going, where's this verse? Well, hang on a minute, I know the verse. But, and, and, and I struggle with some of those things. And sometimes I struggle to get things out. But praise the Lord, you know, he's not in the business of wanting perfect people. He wants people he can use people he can fill. Too often people look at people and they say, oh, they're not going to be any good for the ministry. When I decided to go to Bible college, I had pastors saying, you're too old. You're 40 years old. You, you've had a brain injury. You know, it's going to be too much for you. you we need young brains. And I said, hang on a minute. God has called me to do this. I'm going to do what God says, not what man's trying to tell me to do. And within a matter of 18 months, a pastor came to me and says, listen, God's laid on my heart to take over the church in Goulburn because I'm coming to the college to be the new principal. He's laid it on my heart and, and uh, we, we got to work there and yet without a doubt that was God's work for us to go down to Goulburn. And then all of a sudden we had three pastors and they got together and they said, well, what we'll do, we'll all preach a Sunday, then you preach one because you've got your last two years of Bible college to go through. And they said, yeah, okay. Then, then all of a sudden... All these pastors have been called somewhere else and Deborah and I are left with a church and a year and a half of Bible college still to go. And people were just telling us, I'll oh, just close this ministry, just stop this ministry. And we said, no, hang on a minute, this is God's ministry. Oh, but Bible college is absolutely important, you must do this. I said, hang on a minute, I'm happy to do Bible college, but we're not closing down anything. And God took us all the way through and, and got us. And, Bible college for me was a three-hour drive each way. So we, we went from Goulburn to Sydney, four days a week, which is around about 190 kilometres each way. And uh, we ran the radio ministry that we have on a Tuesday night that still kept up with the youth group, the prayer meetings, and two services on a Sunday. Not through any strength of mine, but that's what God willed. And the people rallied, and, and you know we have a, a wonderful family fellowship. And praise the Lord for that. Now, our message this morning comes from that. So we've got two passages of Scripture, but it's the same. Well, 1 Samuel 2.8, 2 
and Psalm 113, verses 7 and 8. And we'll just have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wonderful grace that we are under. We thank you for your mercy, which is with us each and every day, for the shed blood of your Son on the cross. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your willingness to be obedient to your Father, and we give you the glory for that. And we just pray now that no flesh preach, but your Holy Spirit minister your truth to our hearts, not just to go in, but to transform, and that you receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message is simple. I've just taken it from Scripture, and it's from the dunghill to the palace. From the dunghill to the palace, that's it. You know, all through the ages, those who have lived life on what we might call a lower level seem to be left out. They've been seen to be castaways and, and not worthy of certain stations in society. And I know that. I've been there. People look and say, oh, he's damaged. He's not going to be too much use. And that's not true. That is not true at all. The poor and needy, while looked after to a degree, have in, in reality been disregarded by those who, who like to think they're in a higher order. Or they may be provided with some benefit and some charity. But when you look down through the ages, even to our, our present day, there's a huge gap between those who are poor and those who have it all. And the question is, do they have it all? Do they have it all? See, the, the reality of life is a very, very simple reality, and it's a very simple fact. No matter where a person's station is in life, we are all in need, every single one of us, every single one of us. Because without Christ, everyone is lost. It doesn't matter what material wealth a person may have, what position they hold in society, what part of the world they come from or where they live in. Without Christ, everybody is in poverty. Now, in saying that, I want to get something clear. Being poor does not prove you're a Christian. <laughs> and being rich does not prove that you are a Christian. And, I'm, and the sad fact is many believe that either of those are true. But to be a Christian, you must first be in Christ. And Christ, he must be in you. See, this is a gift that we receive. That's not works. And for a gift, there's got to be a giver, that's God. There's got to be a gift, his son, but there must be a receiver, and that's you and me. Anything added to that, no longer a gift. If I get my grandsons, you go and wash my car, will you do that for me? And I say, we'll do it for you for pop, we'll do it for you for 50 bucks. They're not doing it for a gift, are they? They want $50. There's no longer a gift. The moment you add anything... To the work of Christ on the cross, it's a work and it's not a gift. And too many are, are, are preaching today that you can lose your salvation and you've got to earn it again or that you're a special person chosen and there's not much you can do about it but the person next to you is never going to be chosen. They're elect and they're special and that's not true. You must be born again, not of the flesh but of the spirit. You come to a knowledge, hey, there is a God, that you are out of fellowship with him, and by that I mean you're not right with him, and you accept that. That's called repentance. Then you acknowledge your need of having to be made right with him. In other words, that you're a sinner, that's confession. And you ask him to save you through the finished work done on the cross, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, the, and the resurrected life that he has, and, and that's belief. And you're saved. No one can take it from you. You have not done a thing to earn it. You have humbled yourself. You have repented and you've accepted the gift that God gave you. That's a gift. Nothing else. To add anything to it is a work. There's no other way, there is no other name given among men whereby a man must be saved. And that's Jesus Christ. He and he alone can save you, nothing else. Now our text this morning, I'll start with Psalm 113. It's easy for me, I've got them written down so I don't have to flick through. But it says, verse 7, He raises up the poor out of the dust 
and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. Now, 1 Samuel 2, 7. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillar of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. Now, three things we'll see here today is that we've got to remember man's position. Secondly, we've got to rejoice in our helper. And thirdly, we need to recognize what he has done. So we're to remember our position. In 1 Samuel there it says, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. Listen, God's the one in control, amen? He's in control. Nothing happens outside of God's providence. No matter what the rulers of this world are saying today, no matter what the scientists are trying to say they have proved or try to prove or disapprove of, no matter how rich or poor a person is, God is the one who rules over the affairs of man. What do you think the book of Daniel's about? That's what he's doing. You know, from the, from the day of creation until the, the, the day of destruction, until the day of newness, God is, will, and will always be in control of all things. Nothing happens outside of what God knows. He makes poor, he makes rich. He brings people down to a point and he lifts them back up again. And we've all been there. We've been in places so dark, we're going, well, what is going on? Where is our God? He's right beside you, working out in you his will and his good purposes for your life. So for each and every one of us, he has a plan and a purpose. And if you love him and you're walking with him and you belong to him, he does anything and allows anything to bring about his will in your life. And that's what Romans 8, 28 is all about. All things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things, no matter what it is. And you say, why, Dennis, you, you're electrocuted. You, you couldn't work anymore. You had to leave your job. Hey, I'd rather be in the house of God with the children of God every Sunday than have a good job and good money. That's as simple as that. It all worked together for the good. At the time, it may not have seemed like it, but it did. It did. See, it's in, in grace and, you know, God's power isn't just in his discipline alone. See, God's power is in his grace and his mercy. And we need to recognize that. See, it, it is in his grace and his mercy, he softens heart and hearts. And his grace and mercy means he will do whatever it takes to mould and make us into the image of his son as his children. See, man's position is in the dust and, and, and the sorrow of the dunghill of sin. But he lifts those up with his salvation and he humbles him. They humble themselves before him. They, they accept the gift and he saves them. And, and as children of God, unless we understand James 4.10 completely, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Until then, we are not emptying ourselves enough to allow God to fill us. It's like a bucket of sand and a bucket of water. You can't put the two in together. If you, if you want the Holy Spirit of God to come into your life, you've got to start shoveling the sand out of your life that is taking up the space of the bucket. So the water can fill it. And the more we allow the, the rubbish to go, the more God fills. If we're sincere, if we're honest. Trouble is we've got too much stuff going on as Christians and we're not allowing God the, the right space in our life which he wants, which is our heart. He raises the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. Let me ask you, do you need to be raised up this morning? Raised up from the dust of despair? Do you feel at the moment there may be a hopelessness in your life or in your family? You're praying and praying for someone to be saved, for something to be made right. Hey, brother and sisters, whatsoever not of faith is what? Sin. Simple. End of story. We build our marriage and our ministry on it. See, there may be something you don't see. Oh, I just don't have the strength to overcome. 
Many people are lonely. You may feel abandoned from your family by taking on a stand for Christ. They may have shunned you. Hey, many, their spouse walks out on them. Friends no longer want your company. God will raise you up. He will strengthen you, and it's with his might nothing that we can do. Remember John the Baptist, I'm talking about that this morning in the Bible study. In his moment of loneliness, in his moment of abandonment, when he's in prison, he sends two of his disciples to see if Jesus was the Messiah or not. What did the Lord say to him? Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You know, when Jesus read that in the synagogue, you know, he, he, was, he used to attend the synagogue at Nazareth because in Nazareth, in those days, the men of the, the synagogue would take a turn of reading. They would read from the prophets and they would read from the Torah. And, and that was Jesus' reading. You say God's not putting things together. God knows everything. See, Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor. Listen, that's as great as miracle as any. That the God of this universe, the creator of all things, came to preach the gospel to the poor. Everywhere you go in this world, and I've been around the world twice, there's religion. Everybody's worshipping someone or something. But there's only one, if we can use the word religion that's true, that has equal respect to all, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where you come from, what culture you are, you are equal in his sight. The foot of the cross, the ground is level, brothers and sisters. No ups, no downs. Remember the, the, the Greeks, they had gods and they took pleasure in playing around little games with people and people's lives, causing heartache. That's, that's, that's what they believe. A game of good and evil. If you're good enough, you'll make it. If not, you fail. All other religions have a privileged class. But the one true God lifts the poor. Maybe there's a burden in your life that, that God has placed upon you. You don't have to despair. He wants you to cast that care upon him for the simple reason he careth for you. See, he wants you to take that burden. He says, give it to me. Put it on my shoulder. Walk with me. And I'll carry it with you. And when he does that, and when we do that... <coughs> He takes us through whatever it is. It does not matter what it is. If you put your burden upon him, he will take you through. There is no doubt. No doubt at all. And in saying that, you be very sure your burden is not from sin. Because God has to deal with sin. Otherwise, he's not God. You look back through history, the great men and women of God are the poor he has raised up. You look in your Bible, Gideon, where did he come from? A threshing floor. David, what was he doing? Keeping sheep. No one liked the shepherds, they stink. They didn't want to be near them. The apostles, look at them, fishermen. Tax collectors. Remember Amos, one of my favourites. No training as a prophet at all. And, and, and he, all he was was a herdsman who tended sycamore trees as well called to deliver God's message to the northern kingdom of Israel. The hand of him who thought himself unworthy to unloose the shoes of our Saviour was the very hand the Lord thought worthy to baptise his holy head. The very hand. See, the, the treasure of the gospel has been put into earthen vessels. God's given it to us. It's, it's, it's not in the, the real intelligent or the rich. It's the weak and foolish. Why? Because God wants to confound the wise and mighty. See, until we humble ourselves, until a person repents, they can't be saved.
1 Corinthians 1 26 tells us for you see your calling brethren how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty not many noble are called but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen yea and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence God and God alone gets the glory and that very same God is willing and able to lift you and me up today that's what he wants are you in need today? Are you in need of being lifted from the dunghill? Now, the dunghill was, in, especially in Syria, when firewood was scarce, they, they would use dried dung to, to burn their fuels and heat their homes. And they would get all the ashes from that and they'd put it out by the side of the road. And uh, same in Palestine. And, and, they, and people who were poor would beg beside these piles and then at night when it got very cold, they would crawl into the pile of these ashes uh, to keep them warm. It would, would insulate them. They were outcasts, shut out from society, in a terrible position, alone and without hope. Now you may be here today and have the greatest need of all, and that's to be saved. Don't turn your back on what the Spirit of God is touching your heart with today. <laughs> You could be an outcast, feel that way, alone, shut out from God. You may need salvation. Well, he has purchased it for you. You don't have to buy it. And only he can give it to you, and he can only give it to those who, who call upon him, who humble themselves before them. And he says, I'll lift you up of the, out of the dunghill of this world, and I'm going to place you into my kingdom. And the Lord said in Matthew 4 3, Blessed are the poor of in spirit, for theirs is the, the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, we're to rejoice in our helper. You know, it's an amazing thing to understand that, that God interferes in our lives. The end of 1 Samuel 2, 8, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. The one that Psalm 113.5 tells us dwells on high, the God who rules and reigns from heaven above, the one whom the very existence of this world depends upon, has come into our lives to help us. Do we understand it? Doesn't matter where you're from, what station you are. He has come into our lives to help us. Now mankind under the influence of Satan walks away from God. From his purpose and, and will for him. And as a result, God's love for us, God intervened. He came between us and the devil in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And, and, and he collided head on with the devil's purpose to destroy mankind. And we have complete victory through his son. And you know what most people don't understand? Is we're not going towards a victory. You're not going towards victories in your life. You're coming from one. The cross is the victory. We come from a victory. We're not going towards what? See, the Lord Jesus Christ collided head on with the, with the purpose of Satan to destroy mankind and we have victory through him and him alone. And if you are born again by the Spirit of God, then you need to be rejoicing that God is your helper. Aren't you glad he interfered? I'm rejoicing. He came between me and this world. He intervened. When I was there, it was good to see all those young ones here this morning at Sunday school. You know why I was sent to Sunday school? Because I was one of these crazy little kids who couldn't stop. And mum and dad said, let's find somewhere he can go for two hours on a Sunday so we can have a cup of coffee. That was me. In my day, they were allowed to put a leash on children. I was the one with the leash. He intervened. Why? Because I got sent to Sunday school. And I wish I'd bought it. You know, I still have my Bible for attending 60 Sundays. I was seven, eight years old. That's at home. He intervened on Christmas holidays when we had the, you may remember the CSSM, the Children's Special Service Missions. They would camp at the beaches all along New South Wales for a week at Christmas. Parents loved it. 
There's a bonfire and sausage sizzle on, kids, away you go. They'll take care of you for a few hours and mum and dad can have a break. Praise God they did that. Friday nights as a teenager, listen, I didn't grow up some godly young child from a Christian home. I've got the scars of life on my life. I know what the wrong side of the street's like. I'm not telling you anything new, brothers and sisters. I'm not telling you anything that I, I don't know about. Youth group, nowhere else to go on a Friday night. We'd wander around the park and here's a little church I went to Sunday school at. And the whole pack of teenagers there having youth group. So what did we do? Let's go to youth group. It's much warmer in there than it is out here on a, a late Friday night. Intervened. Intervened when I met my wife. Here's me setting out from Australia on, on, on a boat to cruise, to go around the world at 20 years of age and I got to New Zealand two weeks later. That's where it stopped, brothers and sisters. I met my wife and that took us another 35 years to go anywhere. <laughs> and we all know what that's like. Intervene in, 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 in a woman who, who had also been brought up in a very religious home, bishops and priests. Intervened and when she was saved and the, the testimony and witness, the, the difference, not that she was anything wrong, don't get that idea, but just the change in her, her countenance and her attitude and the way she did things. And man, I want that. You know, I used to come home from work and she'd try and hide her Bible and put it away so she wouldn't upset me. You don't have to do that, ladies, if you're struggling with that in any way. Just leave it open. She asked the pastor around. Ugh, the pastor. What's he coming around for? He challenged me to where I stood before God and, and finally I, I submitted to God's call upon my life. Step after step after step. Let me ask, do you rejoice in your God? Do you really rejoice? Are you prepared to empty the sand out of the bucket so he can put the water of life and fill it? You see, God doesn't stop interfering the day we get saved. It's a work in progress. You know, 62, isn't it? Three, 63 years old. I said, I forget numbers sometimes, but 63 years old. And, you know, sometimes I'm still like a stupid 15-year-old. I do some dumb things, some real dumb things. But he continues to bring us closer and closer and deeper and deeper into a more meaningful relationship with himself every day. Listen, if you think you've made it, you've, you haven't gone anywhere. And too many think that. They think they've got it. They think they've made it. Oh, I've been to Bible college, oh, I've done this, oh, I've done that, and I read my Bible every day and I've made it, and they're not going anywhere. See, that's the carnal Christian. He's saved, not going anywhere. He goes here, oh, there it is, oh no, I'm going back here, there it is, I'm going here, there's God, whoop, I'm going here, I'm back in the world. They don't go anywhere. The spiritual Christian, he empties out the sand, he fills up the bucket with water. He lets God fill it. I like to think I'm level-headed. As you can see, the bubble's in the middle, amen. But I don't have to be level-headed. I have to be God-headed. I have to allow him. I have to allow him to, to, to lead me and guide me, but I have to empty myself before he can do that. You know, through life circumstances, people we meet aren't accidents. Everything, everyone that, that comes into contact with us has its beginning and its purpose in, in our Heavenly Father. And we're being conformed every day into the image of His Son, every moment, whether we're awake or asleep. And let me tell you something, in a conscious or even a subconscious state, and by that I mean when you go to sleep at night, you don't shut down. Your mind is still active. And what you put into your mind before you go to sleep has the utmost effect upon your life. You can do no better thing than to, because my wife used to say, oh, I go to bed and I start praying and I fall asleep. And I say, amen for that. 
Amen for that. It has a big impact on your life, what you are watching and listening to before the lights go out. And that's the best thing in the world, fall to sleep with prayer and godly thoughts on your mind. Rather than what? The cares and the influences of this world. Listen, we would never have gotten out of the state we were in before God intervened in our lives. He sent someone along somewhere along the way. A seed was planted, then a bit of water, and more and more. And we rejoice, you know why? Because he, he stoops down from the, the lofty heights of heaven to take us out of the dung hill. And, and that's the power of God. And there was a girl by the name of Christine and she wanted to just go and, and be a missionary and help missionaries and it was in Southeast Asia. And she went to the missions board and they said, no, listen, you've got to get a Bible college education before you can go. She said, oh. So she did that. She went and done her three years at Bible college and then she finished Bible college and she went back to the missions board and they said, no, we think you're going to have to study some anthropology, you know, the study of of, um, what is it, man's ways. And she said, oh gosh, she said, I've done what you've asked. And she said, the call God wants me to go. So she ended up going. And she gets to this country and she, she gets into the main town and she, there's missionaries everywhere in the town. And she says, well, you know, there's no place here for me. So I just want to go and be a help. She was a qualified nurse. So she just packed her bag and went out into the countryside went into a village, she explained to the, the chief there that she, she was a nurse and she wanted to help people, so he said, yeah, you can set up here. And she started sharing the gospel with the people in this town, this little village. And, and she set up her clinic, and there was a little girl who used to watch. She'd come and she'd stand beside the post and she, she'd be looking in as, as she would hear some hymns being sung and some Bible readings. And this little girl's father, he was one of the, the drunkards of this village. And the witch doctor went to him one day, because this witch doctor, he was upset with Christine starting to change people's lives for the glory of God. And he says, don't let your daughter go there. And the daughter was there, and he come back, and the father said, where have you been? Oh, I was just looking in the tent. He beat her. This is true. He beat her black and blue. One of the ladies came to Christine's tent one night after a drunken binge with his, the father and the witch doctor. And she says, Christine, Christine, come quick. Why, why, what's the problem? And, and she goes over to the infirmary and here's this little girl just laying on a slab. She couldn't even recognise her. She'd been beaten so bad. And in the corner of the, the room is a, a little white rag covered in blood. It was a little dress that Christine had given this, this girl. And the girl's going, Christine, the dress, the dress. She good and she took it to the girl. She says, are you all right? She says, I want to show Jesus the blood I've shed for him. And she went to be with the Lord. Do you rejoice in your Lord? What are you doing for him? Have you shed any blood at all to the glory of God's kingdom? For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. Praise the Lord. Job 26, 7 tells us, He stretches out the north over the empty place and he hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now one of my great things to us, we live in Goulburn, we, in the winter time it gets down to minus 12, minus 13 and the nights are incredible. Clear black skies full of stars. And I often go out there and I come into my wife and I says, no strings attached. No strings attached, they're just there. The glory of God. You see, we're not dangling, waiting for the rope to break. We're in the palm of his hands. We're not dangling. We're upheld by the power of God. That's by the, the power of his word. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, the words, and God said, are mentioned eight times, and, and, and in all but five verses out of, out of 31, you read God created, God saw, God moved, God called, God made, God blessed, the Spirit of God. 
See, it's the power of God that upholds all things. So let me ask you, what can't he do for you then? What can't he do for you? I tell you what he can't do. He can't make you want to love him. He can't make you want to serve him. He can't make you want to humble yourself. the power of God. Hey, listen, what can't he do in your family, brothers and sisters? What can't he do in our country? What can't he do with our circumstances? What can't he do? Where do you go when you need counsel? You ring up a friend who doesn't even come to church? Worldly counsellors? God forbid we do that. You know what worldly counsel do? It deals with the environment around you. It's about your work, your situation, your circumstances. There's the problems. This person's the problem. This place is the problem. Hey, worldly counsel wants one focus of your life, and that's on yourself. Your own sufficiency, and that's where we fall. God wants us to focus on his sufficiency, his strength, his power. God, does, God doesn't want us to, he doesn't want to change what's around us. God wants to change what's in us, not what's around us. He wants to change our weaknesses, our pride, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, that feeling sorry about our situation. That's what he's about changing. Now, if we take the verse there in Job figuratively, then his sovereignty can't even be disputed. He rules no matter what happens. Listen, we stand in the power of the cross. We stand in the power of the resurrection. We stand in the power of his ascension. What can't he do? See, you can be in no better place than God's will for your life, and if you're sincere in that, then he will move heaven and earth to show you his will. See, God knows exactly where you are in your walk with him, and he knows exactly where I am in my walk with me. Of course, I'm here preaching and I'm a pastor. I'm no different to you guys. Let me tell you right now. You ask my wife, do my socks stink like everyone else's? Yes, you go to you, they sure do. Oh, pastors, we face different things. We've got a lot to put up with. But as a person, my sin nature is no different than anybody else. See, God knows exactly where we all are in our walk with him and he knows what it's going to take to get our attention be a restless spirit, a spoken word, disappointments. Let me tell you something. When he gives you an unusual blessing, that's when you really got to pay attention. See, when these things occur, you've got to ask him, hey, what do you want to tell me, Lord? And then you, you listen, not to hear, but to obey. Do you know that if you obey God, all the consequences of that obedience is no longer yours, it's his. Write that down. You walk in obedience, there is consequences, not yours. For the pillar of the earth are the Lord's, and he set the world upon them. They belong to him. Thirdly, we're to recognise what he's done. 1 Samuel 2 8 says, to set them among princes and to make them to inherit the throne of glory. See, God has reached down and he's reached down through his son to his children and he says, listen, I want to lift you out of that woeful condition that you're in. I want to get you back in line with the very first purpose I had for mankind. That is to, to worship and fellowship with me. You know, one of the great things that my wife talk, talk about, isn't it great that, to understand, listen, and of course as parents, it's good, Adam and Eve disobeyed their father. Did they not? See, God wants to set us among princes. And he's acquired that through his grace. And it's at a place at the, the throne of his glory. Psalm 113, 8, that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. You know, the Lord, is one thing I've learned, he never does anything by halves. 
never does anything by halves. We're not half saved. We're fully saved. We don't have a salvation that's halfway there. It's complete. Full. Nothing we can do to add to it. Nothing we can do to take away from it. It's, it, it's been settled once and for all through the shed blood of his son. Settled in the council before God even created this world where the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit got together and they said, here's the plan. And Jesus said, I will. I will. See, we've been made kings and priests under God forever. And we will reign forever and ever. And, and our salvation, brothers and sisters, is not of one of poverty. It is one of wealth. The wealth of princes. And instead of dishonour, we, we, we're given an exalted rank of above the princes. If you're born again, you, you're above any prince in this world. You're set among the princes of God's people. Now, and the Lord did that for us. Now in Isaiah 53, 11, we read, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. An interesting word, travail, and it's a, and very interesting because the fact that it comes from a word that means maternal. It's talking about maternity. It, it's a, a pain soon to be forgotten in joy. That's what it means. And, and, and its picture is, is, is for us, is struggling and, and, and suffering and, and, and bravely enduring so that a new birth can take place in our life. See, there's, there's a new name. The hymn tells us a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. You know, the old-time preachers would contemplate the, the miseries of those they saw struggling in battle with, with, the, with the Holy Spirit as he's working on their lives. And, and they, they had a word for it before they got saved, and it was conviction of sin. Conviction of sin. See, conviction comes before conversion, repentance before rebirth, and travail before trust. Revelation 1.6 tells us he has made us kings and priests under God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now we're not called kings in the sense of being royal, but Christ sits on the throne of our, our souls and, and he enables us to live for him. And again, you've got to get the sand out of the bucket, brothers and sisters. We all do. And allow the water of the Spirit to fill it. He was in us when we were poor. And now, as, as we go through our Christian life, he, he reigns within us. You know, we're, we're part of a royal priesthood. You know, what greater place to be than in the service of God who, who has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and, and put us into the marvellous kingdom of his light? What better place could we be? You know, 1 Peter 2, 9, we, we all know this. You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Oh, what a position we hold. See, before, God, before knowing God, I, my, my life was dark and dead. But as God worked and the circumstances came along and, and a, as Christians gave of themselves to witness and to testify of the grace of God, the seeds are planted, they're watered. And if God's watering the seed, it's going to sprout. It's going to sprout. And, and we don't longer live a life of darkness. We're, 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 we're shed with the, with the light of God and we're, we're people under the mercy of God and we've been saved from hell and, and we're, we're not only being placed into the kingdom of God, but brothers and sisters, today, tomorrow, to yesterday is his preparations for us to be there. <coughs> and our life with him is, is safe and secure, but it's always a life that's changing in that we are constantly called to make adjustments. 
You know, we, we comes into our life and we have a crisis of belief where, where God, who has saved us, he then begins to direct us beyond what we know to do. And over the years, I've come to, and this may sound a bit sick, but I've come to enjoy that. Oh, what's going to happen now? I'm ready to go, Lord. Just, just give me the single signal. He's at work. But when we don't understand the, the relationship he wants with us, it's not about just knowing the Bible. It's not about knowing doctrines and, and all these things which are important. God wants the relationship with you to be intimate and personal. That's who he is. He is an intimate and personal God. And he's wanting to bring us into a relationship based on his love. Based on, on faith and obedience to his will for our life. We, we see no better illustration than that. Remember when the Lord was talking to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And the word love that the Lord used was divine love, agape love. And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you, which was philia, which was a brotherly love. And the Lord says again, Peter, do you love me? And he says, you know that I love you. And the third time, he says, Peter, do you love me? Agape. And Peter says, you know that I love you. And he said, oh, look, then Peter added, thou knowest all things. You know what the Lord's doing? He's drawing out of Peter what Peter needed to know about himself. That's a love relationship. And that's what he does with us each day. See, when God speaks to us, revealing what he's about to do, that's our invitation to adjust our lives to him. And, and when we do that, then and only then are we are in a position to obey him. And, and, and we cannot continue life as usual or stay where we are and go with God at the same time. Now, God has called each and every one of us to be on mission with him. Every one of us. You must say, oh, well, I can't go anywhere. I can't do this. You know, praise God for, for the ladies who keep kitchens clean at church. Praise God for, for the people who come in and take a seat, willing to hear the word of God. They may not have much. They may be poor. They may be struggling mentally. God loves them. You know what we're to do? If we, if we can see that, we're to uplift them, to come alongside them, to help them. That's a church. That's a fellowship. It's not about setting out standards and, and different classes. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's taken us from the dunghill and placed us in the palace. Isn't that what you want for others? I remember the pastor, he's telling us a story. I'll finish with this. He's telling us a story and... He, he'd been to Bible college and he got his degree and they were moving to, to a town and, and he, he, they were looking for some work and the, 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 he had a year to go at Bible college. That's why I remember it because it uh, sounds a bit like us. He had a year to go at Bible college. His wife was a nurse and she had some part-time work and they'd gone back to where they'd come from and they met some friends. They said, come over for dinner. And they invited their friends over for dinner and they're all talking around dinner. And, and the pastor and his wife, they, they notice their friends are really, oh, oh they're, they're on edge. They go, what's wrong? And they go, oh, we've got something to tell you. And he said, why? What's happened? What's wrong? And they said, we've been saved. We couldn't wait to come, come over when we heard you were back in town. We couldn't wait to tell you we've been saved. And they all got up from the table and the pastor and his wife are jumping up and they're, we're saved too. Sorry. And they're all happy. And they said, when did you get saved? Oh, about 10 years ago. What? You couldn't be bothered to tell us? You were going to leave us without knowing? From the dunghill to the palace. 
Remember your position. Rejoice in your God. Recognize what he has done. And reach out to others the same way he's reached out to you. All the people said? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you for the great God that you are. Lord, as we've all been challenged here today, let us not put that aside, because that's where it stops, Lord. That's where the work will stop. Help us to repent, recognise, and rejoice in the great God that you are. And we give you the glory for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.